So this process is biological and it's actually uh, microbial activity that's producing heat. It's consuming the carcass. So, you know, I try to remind people it's not just heating that pile and killing it. We need some time in there to degrade all these carcasses so we can degrade the tissue and degrade the bone all into a stable humus-like product. And if you do it right, you can control odors, you can get a nice cap on it, a nice filter, and you can reduce fly exposure as well. The science of this, whether we're talking a horse or a chicken, is you need a, a nitrogen source, which is a carcass, uh, you need some manure, and uh, you need carbon. So I've worked with wood shavings, I've worked with corn stover, both of those worked really well. If you're in Arkansas, Louisiana, you might start looking at things like rice holes. Um, all you guys that are in Georgia area, maybe peanut holes. You need some airflow though. This is an aerobic process. So if you see on this image, air is actually coming up through the coming through the bottom of the pile and then rising up. Uh, you're producing heat from the metabolic activity of those microorganisms. And you're gonna need some moisture in there too. So the carcass itself can provide that moisture if you get it in the pile soon enough. If you're dealing with a really, really dry material, uh, you might need to add some moisture to it. Think of this as above, above ground degradation. You're, you're uh, putting those birds and surrounding them with carbon and you give it time and they'll break down. So I liken this to uh, a Twinkie, if you will. I, I try to plan an image that it's easy to understand when I'm going out in the field and discussing this. And, and uh, this one seems to really fit. So, you know, you've got this, this uh, snack cake, this sponge uh, Twinkie. It's got a, a cream center to it, and the cream center is going to be your, your poultry carcasses. And then you surround all of that with uh, fresh carbon material and uh, let it do its work, and it'll break all that down. The amount of carbon that you need depends on, on the house size, depends on the litter depth, the litter age, the amount of carcass material. So this varies um, from not only farm to farm, but uh, house to house. You know, I've been on operations where they had one foot depth of litter, and I'll show you an image of that in a second. Uh, when we go and, and try to build a windrow in that house, there's so much litter in there that I don't really have room for additional fresh carbon. So we make use of that litter as our, as our composting carbon source. Um, I've gone in houses on the same farm that had four inches of litter depth. So we're gonna need a lot more carbon uh, brought onto that farm. And we have calculations on how to do this. A general rule of thumb is 1.5 pounds of carbon material for every pound of carcass material. But if you really want to get into the nuts and bolts, we, we have calculations to determine the amount that you would need per house. The carbon sources, I like wood shavings, I like corn stover. You, you might look at hardwood chips uh, as well, but whatever is in your region. And uh, you know, like I said, if you're in, in Georgia, Alabama, you might be looking at peanut holes. And, and the thing I should mention on this is we need something with a high carbon to nitrogen ratio. So the higher the better because we're overloading this system. We're pushing it to the limits. And the reason we are is that cream center, that Twinkie, is nothing but nitrogen, you know, essentially. You, you have all these nitrogen carcasses. You have uh, all the nitrogen from the poultry litter. So you want something that's got a high C to N to surround that material so it actually goes through a proper compost. And you have to consider porosity. Uh, on the left is junk material they sent us and, and we didn't use. Um, at the bottom, you're seeing rice holes and oat holes. It's a very fine material. The fine material, you know, I'd prefer to have that on the top because it's going to uh, provide that cap, that insulation, hold that heat in. But on the bottom layer, I want something that maybe has a little more porosity so you allow that airflow to go through it. And the top picture here, what we're looking at is uh, actually corn stover. So here are some broiler and turkey house procedures. Um, first, euthanasia would occur if you're using a foaming unit. Um, here's an image of that. The goal is 24 hour completion. And this is kind of what it looks like during and after a uh, foam event. 
you can see that uh, one issue or challenge I have is half the house is dry litter, half the house now is going to have a wetter litter. And that can work to your advantage if, if, uh, if you get it properly mixed. Uh, you're seeing this, uh, this is where the birds are, are kind of pushed to one end of the house for uh, foaming. And I hope that you guys never have to witness this because it's not fun. And here's some of the foam dissipating. One thing you'll notice, um, part of your house is going to be really wet. You have very wet, slick litter. And it's not only hard to walk through, but uh, it's kind of hard to get equipment through as well. So this is where choosing the right equipment is very important. Uh, for this, I'd want to use track loaders. Prep in the house. This is something that I'd like all of us to think about. How can we improve uh, getting these cables and hoses out of the way for equipment? Because time and time again, um, we, we don't really focus on this. And if we have any of this low-lying equipment, it gets torn up by skid loaders. So when would be a good time to get this out? If we're going to have to take all this down and clean and disinfect it before we can get new birds, let's go ahead and do this on the front end and uh, get this material out of our way. Because the next thing you're doing is you're bringing in equipment into this house and those fans and some of those drinkers are going to get knocked around and beat up. And then the next thing that we have to do is take all these carcasses that are at one end of the house, move them, and equally distribute them uh, throughout the entire house. And that can be a challenge as well. So this is the other snack cake reference uh, besides Twinkies. Jelly rolls are, are something that I try to tell producers to envision that I want them to create. And here's what I'm talking about. You go down the side walls of each house, and you start moving the litter and the turkeys into these jelly rolls. Okay. And uh, then you can see all these birds in the center are then moved over to those jelly rolls as well. You can tell from this image that this is a high path event. Why is that? It's because they're all equally distributed, all right? We didn't have to euthanize them. They just died. So we clear out the center highway, as I call it. <clears throat> I like this procedure because what you're seeing here is you're, you're killing virus. When I would go look at these piles, place a thermometer in them, I was looking at 115 to 125 Celsius. That's killing virus. You're also starting to degrade this carcass. So this carcass starts degrading, and in the meantime, we're waiting on that carbon supply to show up. So that's the method I like to do. This is the house where we had litter that was one foot uh, in depth. and uh, so imagine we, we've cleared this highway, we're going to place our carbon down, and now we're taking all this material and putting on top of it. You know, those, those windrows were like 10 feet high, and I didn't have room for additional carbon. So this varies from house to house as to how much additional carbon you would need. In this house, we didn't really have to bring in much carbon. We utilized what we had with all that excess litter. Um, make sure you get the feed lines and feed bins uh, emptied. Uh, you don't want to find out at the, you know, four days into this that there's half a feed bin still full. So go check all of them. You can either equally distribute it over the litter or the carcasses, or you can just put it on top of those windrows. But this is the uh, best way to get rid of the feed. We can just compost it down. The sidewalls need to be cleaned. I think this is the best time to do your sidewall cleaning. All the organic matter in there, I would rather get it on the pile, compost it, break it down, rather than have to come in and clean and disinfect it later. So, you know, this is where manual labor comes in. Get some people with shovels, start cleaning those sidewalls. <clears throat> you might need to add moisture. Um, if the carcasses are fresh and they haven't lost that leachate yet, you usually can get by without it. Uh, if you have a tank sprayer on hand, it certainly wouldn't help to add a little, or certainly wouldn't hurt to add a little moisture to these uh, piles. And uh, you know, if, if you're really desperate, you can you can turn waters and drinkers upside down. The consistency that you want to see, and this is another one of these analogies when I'm talking to producers, uh, I want it to look like chewing tobacco. 
So uh, Redman Golden Blend, Levi Garrett, that's kind of what this looks like in this image. If you squeeze this material, it's leaving some, some dampness on the palm of your hand, but you're not wringing out water. And that's about 50% moisture content, rule of thumb. Here we're forming our base, and we've added 8 to 12 inches of carbon to the center of the house. That base is fresh material. It looks really good. 12 to 15 feet wide, and we do not drive equipment on this. So you're going to have to take this material down and dump it and then back out. And that takes some time. So this is where you've got to start thinking about what type of equipment do you, uh, do you want. Driving on it compacts it. It doesn't allow that airflow to go through it. Here's a uh, video of after we have the base laid, we're taking and essentially building the cream center of that Twinkie. So we're taking the, the litter and we're taking the carcasses and we're placing it on top of that base. The base is the most important component in my mind. It's absorbing all that leachate and it's allowing airflow to go through it. It's all about that base. So then you add 8 to 12 inches of carbon on top of that. You have your final Twinkie extending the length of the house. Leave about 30 feet at the end of the house. Also leave yourself some room on both indoors so you, so you can get equipment in and out. But when we actually turn this Twinkie, we're not going to turn it over to one side. Because if you look at this picture, the highest part of the house is in the center. So you start turning this over and getting into your, your feeders and drinker lines. Uh, you'll start tearing stuff up when you lift your, your skid loaders um, up and your buckets up. So what we want to do, and I'll show you later, we essentially take this Twinkie and move it 30 feet down the house. Uh, so save yourself some room down there so that you can actually turn this thing and move it. Now there's another method. You know, I talked about building the jelly rolls you can just go in there and clear a highway down the center of the house. And you can see that carcasses are left along the side walls in this instance. If you get to this quickly and have enough labor and equipment, this method works fine. However, if you simply clear a highway down the center of the house and then wait three or four days, what's going to happen? These things are decomposing, you're attracting flies, and you can get into some serious issues. So if you're going to get to it quickly, then this method will be fine. If you're not, then I recommend the jelly roll method where you're move, pushing all that stuff together and starting to heat those piles. Here you can see we uh, have that fresh carbon in the center of the house, but we've got all those birds lying on the sidewalls. Final windrow, 5 to 7 feet high, 12 to 15 feet wide, extending the length of the house. And this is the chimney effect where the cream center of that Twinkie is heating up, all that microbial activity is occurring, their metabolic heat does what? Rises up, it goes through the top of this. That's where you, you have a nice fine cap, like a rice hole cap, if you have the luxury to use that to kind of hold and insulate that pile. And it's very important to have that base at the bottom so you have oxygen flow coming through that and back up to the top. Um, another reason you don't want to compact this. So if, when you're, when you're uh, building this pile, you do not want the equipment to drive up on the sides of that, that base layer because if it does, it's going to compact it down and not allow airflow to go through that. Now I've seen piles cool down and not perform properly because they drove equipment up on it. Pole barns are a headache, as you can see. Why? Roller breeder houses. Um, so we have some theories on what we would do with this. You have a scratch area, you often have a slat area, and a one to two foot drop off. So that does create challenges for getting equipment in and out of there. There are ceiling challenges with the nest boxes, uh, just right above that skid loader. Dr. Mike Heron on the right is 510, and you can see it looks like he's almost touching those boxes. So in these cases, outdoor composting might be your best option if you have the available landmass for it. Um, what I would do is go in, and, and 
you know, if you guys have other ideas, um, but this is just my, my opinion, I'd go in, the, the birds are going to be euthanized in the center scratch area, and then we start moving slats out, we start moving manure out from each side, and we basically build the same Twinkie outside using the same meth methodology that, that we talked about before. So birds could be moved onto that slat area at night, perhaps, and then euthanized uh, in the morning. If you get some house wrap, like Tyvek house wrap, to go around the scratch area and also allow yourself some room so that skid loader can get inside to access all of them, uh, that's one theory. Another theory is in-house composting, and it can be done. You, you first want to get all the slats out. You then want to move the birds from the scratch area over into the slat area with the manure, and then you're going to lay your base or your pad down. Birds and manure are then going to go back on top of that pad, and then you're going to cap it off. And would it be a little more um, time intensive? Yes. Can it be done? Yes. Our colleagues in Canada uh, did that. You see the birds are are uh, euthanized in the center, the slats are removed, and then they started clearing a, a aisle on the sides where the slat area is. Birds are then moved to that slat area, and uh, then we have a, you know, carbon laid uh, down in that slat area, birds placed on top of it, and you got to be careful maneuvering around, but it can be done. Commercial layer operations, uh, you're not going to be doing this indoors, uh, likely outdoors, so hopefully there's land mass to, to build those windrows outside. Now, once we get this thing built, we're going to flag it, monitor the piles daily. It goes through a couple of phases of composting. So phase one composting is two weeks, and your goal is reaching 131 Fahrenheit for three days consecutively. After the 14 days is up, you can turn the pile. You go through a second phase of composting, which is the exact same. Another 14 days, you reach that target temperature for three days. Once you're at day 28, you're, you can have someone sign off on that pile, and it can be moved outside of that house, stockpiled on the farm until the quarantine is lifted. If it's going off-site, it must be permitted by the appropriate state authority or uh, USDA APHIS if they are involved. And going back to what I said earlier, you really need that full 28 days to break down these carcasses. So yeah, we might achieve these temperatures in less than 28 days, and maybe we, we're comfortable with viral kill, but we don't want chunks of meat going out, so we want all this composted down. Turning. All right, so think of this Twinkie now as a pencil, a large pencil in the center of the house. And we're going to sharpen it. Instead of using a knife, we're going to use two skid steers. The skid steers are working in tandem. One comes in, picks up material, moves it 20 feet forward, backs up. The other one comes in, picks up material, and it's just like sharpening a knife, uh, sharpening a, a pencil with a knife. This is what material looks like within 14 days. So the seven to 10,000 turkeys that you saw earlier in two weeks are converted to this black humus-like material. And here are the skid loaders. One moves forward, picks up material. You can see some heat and some ammonia coming off that. They back up, the next loader moves forward, picks up material. It's important that you raise that bucket high, get a good aeration. And this is what it looks like at 14 days. Again, 14 days, dark humus-like material. You have some chunks of meat that kind of fall down to the side there. They're cooked, maybe not edible, but call them turkey balls. They kind of roll down to the bottom, and you got to pick them back up with a shovel and then cover them up. But it's cooked meat. Okay, Leslie says i got about 10 minutes left. 
Uh, end of phase one composting, you see some cooked meat. This is the end product. It's a very good fertilizer and soil amendment. Uh, we see values that are similar to what we see with commercial roller or turkey litter. For those that want more information on this, uh, we have a couple of uh, resources. One is the mortality composting protocol for avian influenza infected flocks. So if you just Google that, uh, you can pull this up and it covers everything I've mentioned today. It shows uh, pictures and it talks about that calculation for carbon. We also have a fact sheet from OSU on mortality management during an avian influenza outbreak, which covers the, the different disposal options and then focuses a little bit at, on composting. So if you don't want the, if you want the short version of it, look at, look at the fact sheet. The last part, which is pretty quick, is lessons learned. You don't want to be buying this, uh, these supplies uh, during an outbreak. So make sure you're well clipped on PPE. You're going to need some portable pressure washers because you may need to set up a station at, at each uh, operation to wash tires. Uh, hand pump spray sprayers, disinfectant, you know, who are you going to go to to get skid loaders? Um, who's going to be the operators? And uh, thermometers, you know, everybody is going to be making a run on thermometers on Amazon. So uh, think of that. Landscape scape rakes work well for raking those piles, and I learned that snow shovels work really well also. You just get some strange looks when you're buying snow shovels in April when it's 70 degrees outside. Challenges with litter moisture content uh, is now the challenge is to take the wet and the dry and mix them up. Um, carcass distribution is a challenge as well. Whole barns are just a headache all in of themselves. Brooder houses, um, maneuvering challenges due to low-hanging equipment. 